Please be seated. It's another wonderful Lord's Day morning, and uh, today we will conclude the series that we've been doing. I entitled the Stages of Faith Development, and the whole point uh, I've been trying to make is that there are stages of growth that if you grow to maturity in Christ that you will go through, beginning in chaos and heading to conformity stage, and going through a questioning phase, and hopefully eventually arriving at conviction stage of faith. And we've looked at a number of examples of individuals going through this process. You know, Abraham and Jacob, Job, and then we began last week looking at Paul uh, at his conformity phase when he was led into questioning and to rethink everything uh, as he was converted to Christ. And this week we want to look at the conviction stage of Paul. First of all, to really understand Paul, we have to understand the Old Testament. Paul was a student of the Old Testament, and he recognized that what Christ was doing was a fulfillment of these hopes. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, we read about spiritual circumcision. Physical circumcision was a sign of the covenant. It was to remind all males that uh, their genitalia did not belong to themselves, but it was there given by the grace of God for his purposes uh, in order to be used morally, in order to have children, and to fulfill the promises that he made to Abraham. But in the book of Deuteronomy, as Moses talks about it, he looks to a future, a future in which the people of God will not fail to live out God's purposes, but instead will faithfully live out God's purposes. And in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he says, The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and live. So God, through Moses, is saying in the future, I'm going to circumcise your heart in such a way that you'll have a heart transplant, if you will, to have a heart of obedience a heart of love so that you can love God completely. So Moses recognized there was going to have to be a major spiritual transformation for the purposes of God to be uh, fulfilled in his covenant people, Israel. And then again later, now we're going a thousand years later, a prophet Ezekiel the people had partially been carried off into exile in Babylon. And from exile, God spoke to the prophet Ezekiel and again looked to the future for a transformation that would take place in chapter 36, verse 26. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. So here again it talks about a spiritual circumcision and it talks about the dynamic power of God that would accomplish this and it says it's by the Spirit of God. Uh, the word in the Old Testament for spirit is ruach. So the ruach of God, the same spirit that hovered over the waters in creation, would now be a part of the new creation that God was planning to accomplish as the prophet Ezekiel looked to the future 
and what God was planning to do. Which leads us to our text today with that backdrop. We see what Paul had to say about spiritual circumcision in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So Paul is identifying himself and the believers in Christ as those that have experienced the spiritual circumcision talking about by Moses and later by Ezekiel. And so he says, now we serve or worship God through Christ Jesus by the Spirit of God as Ezekiel had foreseen. And so therefore he boasts or places his confidence in Christ Jesus, not in his own fleshly ability uh, to be righteous on his own. So spiritual circumcision is the transformation that takes place when we repent and turning to God and seeking salvation through Jesus Christ. This is the turning point for us. And in baptism, God gives us the gift of his indwelling spirit to live in us, to empower us, and to guide us. That's why we are the true circumcision, as Paul said. Then this is verses we looked at last week, but we'll connect it now with its context. Verse 4 through 6, Paul talks about what confidence he could have in his earthly status. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if someone else thinks they are or have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So here he says, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee trained in the law. As far as righteousness, under the law, I was faultless. In other words, he was following the law of his ancestors, the law of Moses, conscientiously. And of course, Paul, in so doing, uh, saw in Christ and the Jewish Christian followers of Jesus a threat to the Judaism that he understood. The Judaism that Paul understood was a nationalistic zeal that the state of Judea would receive their messianic king and he would lead them to put off the shackles of the Romans and to become the dominant power in the world. And again, from their point of view, they were going to force the world to worship the one true God and to get rid of all the idolatry. But Paul and others of his ilk felt like that the only way to do this would be through military might. And they looked for a military messiah. But Jesus didn't fit the bill at all. And the Jewish followers of Jesus were even interacting with some of the Gentiles. And Paul saw this as a threat to his understanding of what true righteousness was. As we said last week, he did this in sincerity. So you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. And Paul was deeply wrong in what he was doing. And on the Damascus Road when he confronted the living Christ, the one he thought they had killed, uh, he was shocked into a new reality in his life. And so think about it. The Apostle Paul 
have become a prominent citizen of Judea. A Hebrew of Hebrews probably suggests that his family was part of the aristocracy. They were part of the affluent leadership of the nation. Perhaps even his father might have served on the Sanhedrin. And Paul was so intimately acquainted with these leaders, he went to the chief priests and got letters of introduction so he could go to Damascus to persecute the Christians there. So he was known by the leaders of the religious establishment there. So I see Paul on a track towards becoming one of the leaders of Israel, one of the members of the Sanhedrin. There was approximately 70 of these men. And Paul was moving up in his status and becoming a leader among his people. And so if you talk about confidence in the flesh, he had attained great status. But notice what he has to say. Uh, it cost Paul everything to follow Jesus. Verse 7. But whatever was gain to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ. Now we don't oftentimes think about it. What did it cost Paul to follow Christ? I'm sure his family considered him a traitor. I'm sure he was disinherited. I'm sure whatever wealth the family had was taken away where he could have no access to it. I'm sure his relatives were ashamed of him because he was no longer a leader of Israel, but instead had followed this ragtag group of people that were following the would-be Messiah Jesus that the Romans had executed. But some of the Jews claimed that he had come back, and uh, they considered this to be a heresy. Some have even suggested Paul might have been buried at this stage, and it may have cost him his marriage. Wife may have separated from him. We do know Paul was single as we read about him in the New Testament. We don't know if his wife had died or, or she left him over this. We don't know. But we do know the Jews uh, uh, all saw it as an obligation if they were traditional Jews to get married. So there's no reason to believe that Paul was not married. And you didn't go into leadership role until you got into your 30s. So Paul, when he was converted to Christ, was probably in his early 30s. Just now exerting his influence, having been trained by the famous uh, Rabbi Gamaliel. And he was rising in status, and as I said, probably from an affluent family. And then he went from prominence to become a nobody, a hated part of the heresy, and had to spend the rest of his life uh, trying to support himself, to preach the gospel, and under all kinds of desperate circumstances. Paul, at one place in Corinthians, mentions some of the things he had to suffer. He was beaten with rods. He was taken out and attempted to stone him to death, but he survived. Uh, he had been in danger from thieves on the road and been at sea uh, for days after a shipwreck. So Paul went through every kind of hardship. And yet he considered his easier, status-filled life he'd left as garbage compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. You know, what are we willing to give up to follow Christ? 
Would you give everything up? Your family? Your resources that come from them? Your status? Your educational attainments? And become a vagabond like Paul? Roaming around trying to spread good news? Uh, using his skills to make tents to survive among the population? Would you be willing to make such a sacrifice? That's what Paul did, and he said, now years after he had made such a decision, it was worth it for coming to know Christ, to know the true Messiah of Israel. And then he talked about the righteousness of God. And to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So righteousness in the Old Testament had the meaning of doing the right thing, obeying the will of God, caring for the needy, living a moral life. And Paul had meticulously followed that in his previous life. But he realized his own self-achieved righteousness was nothing compared to the righteousness that he could receive as a gift by faith from Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to award all of us a status we don't deserve. That we be considered before God like God considers Jesus. Sinless and his son. So through the righteousness of Christ, God now sees us and considers us his children loved of God, and we do that by receiving by faith the righteousness of Christ. And it becomes all about, Paul says, this is what can, maturity is, it's about knowing Christ. Verse 10, I want to know Christ. The idea of knowing here is intimate knowledge. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate, our fellowship, in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. So he wanted to live a life in which he participated in the resurrection power of Jesus, that's the power the New Testament says is unleashed in us through the spirit that lives in us. And so Paul received the power of resurrection to live his life because that was knowing Christ. But knowing Christ is not all uh, wonderful, powerful things, but it's a willingness to suffer for Christ and for doing the right thing. And so he says, I want to also participate in the sufferings of Christ, even if to death. And for Paul, he suffered death for following Christ. As the book of Acts ends, telling us Paul petitioning his case to the Roman emperor, at the time was the corrupt Nero, uh, and we understand that because he was a Roman citizen, he was not crucified, but he was beheaded for his faith in Christ. And so this is while he's still in prison, before his outcome was certain. But here is Paul saying, what I'm striving for is knowing Christ, participating in his life, willing to suffer with him, and living by the power of resurrection. That's the life of the spirit that goes on within me. But Paul did not think, even though he was mature, that he had arrived. 
he says very clearly, verse 12, not that I've already obtained all this or have already uh, arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. So maturity is not arriving at some mature status where I, I've arrived, I, I've figured it all out, I got my act together, and here I am. Paul, who had matured many years, this is probably some 30 years later, he writes the Philippian correspondence, as in the letter he says he's in chains, so he's on his way to Rome, or perhaps even in Rome, when he writes this particular letter. And Paul was a mature Christian man in his 60s. But he said, look, it's not about arriving. It's about being in the race. And we've seen a lot of top athletes uh, over the last few weeks from all over the world competing in the Olympics. And in the Olympics, you put everything you have in order to succeed at what you're trying to do, to take hold of the prize, to win the race. And here Paul is saying, I consider myself to be and continue to be in the race. And he uses some very much uh, language of the games of the first century as he expresses himself further when he says, one thing I do, verse 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize, see the idea of the idea of the athletic event, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So what's the one thing he does? Forgetting what's behind. A runner can't be running down the race and looking too much behind or what will happen is that that will slow them down and the people they're racing against will race ahead of them and they'll win the prize and the person looking back will lose the race. Uh, I, I was taught that from a very early age, probably fourth grade. My natural tendency when running races was look, see, how am I doing with everybody else? And the coaches convinced me, no, no, no. Don't do that. That'll slow you down. You want to win the race, you have to look ahead to the goal and run all the way through the end. And so Paul is saying that's the way it is in Christ. You're never through until it's all over, until your life wraps up completely. And meanwhile, what one thing do you do? You have to forget what's past. Now for Paul, that's he had to forget all the status and things he could have had, uh, he had to forget about all the trials and difficulties he went through, and he had to concentrate instead on where he was now, in the moment, and to remember he's still in the race. You and I, if we are Christians, are in the race. We're running the spiritual race that Christ has set before us. In the Olympics, not everybody runs the same type of race, but everybody competes to receive the prize. And we have a prize. It's eternal life, resurrection life. And so he says, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So God has called us to run through the tape and that when we pass that tape, which is the end of our life, or the return of Christ, then all the unseen things will become visible, 
and the reality of what we've been involved in will suddenly be visible to all. And everyone will know that you and I were in the race and that we have received the prize. Notice he said, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead. The Greek word there for straining is one of my favorite Greek words. It's a term of struggle that goes on in the arena. The agon was the Greek word for the arena where athletic and other contests took place. And the word here for straining in the arena is derived from that, agonizomai. You can hear the straining in that if you listen, agonizomai. That's agonizing, struggling in the arena. It means you have opposition. It means that you have difficulty, but it means that you are in the race. And so one thing he does, not just forgetting what's past, but agonizomai, willing to agonizingly struggle to get to the finish line. And Paul ran all the way through the tape at the end uh, where he was beheaded for Christ. Are we willing to make the same commitment? Who knows where our country is going, uh, what they'll do to Christians in the future. Uh, will you be one that's willing to give it all up? Or will you be a happy days uh, Christian when everything goes good until there are problems? Then Paul talked about the mature view. He's basically explaining to them that his perspective is the mature way to look at things. So in chapter 3, when he explains in more detail this whole idea of his maturity in Christ, he says, verse 15, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. So what Paul just described is the mature way to look at your life. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. So let God, if you don't understand all this, God will make it clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. You know, sometimes we get distracted and we lose ground that we've already traversed in our struggle to be Christ-like. So don't become distracted. Uh, yes, you've made a lot of progress, but you can do regress too if you're not straining to move to the goal to win the prize of eternal life. We are in the race. The question is whether we'll be in the race to the end or whether we'll quit. I think it was one of the races, uh, I'm thinking maybe the 500 meter, 1500 meter, one of the young ladies that was leading the race ran around the track and then just ran off the track. Now, I'm sure maybe she had some injury. I'm sure there was some reason for that. But, you know, you could be in the race, and this young woman appeared to be in the leading pack of the race, and that theoretically she could win it. But if you choose to quit, you don't get the prize. She didn't get a gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal, thank you for showing up medal. She quit. Let's not be quitters. Let's stay in the race. Yes, at times it's difficult, but it's worth the cost. Amen. God has called us to the heavenly reward, and let's not give up on what God has called us to in Christ. And then finally, Paul talks about modeling uh, maturity. Join together. He tells the Christians at Philippi, and following my example, brothers and sisters, 
And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. You know, the bottom line about Paul's view is this. The goal is not merely converting people to Christ, but mentoring them to maturity. Uh, Paul wanted to convert people to Christ in order to reorient their lives and then to mentor and train them to where they could become mature. Uh, we don't want to create a church uh, that's a kindergarten only. You know, what are we going to do if everybody's in the kindergarten? Nobody's old enough to teach any of the classes. Who's going to teach the kindergartners? Is one of them going to teach? I can imagine what kind of class that would be. And one of the kindergartners decided she was going or he was going to teach. Point is, yes, we want to constantly be bringing people in, new children in Christ, young children in Christ, but we want to with the same zeal that we reached out to bring them to Christ, we want to have the same zeal to help them grow up. My parents were not just happy I was born, and they didn't they, they, he's healthy, good child, hope everything goes well for him. Uh, you know, we're leaving him here in the hospital, but we did our part. We birthed him. So it's up to you, son. I hope things work out well. Well, what's a baby going to do in a crib without nurture and care, without opportunities, discipline, and help, I would have never grown up. Or it, without their help, I could have grown up much worse. You know, there are a lot of people that get older, but they never grow up. There are a lot of people at age 60 and 70 that act like a bunch of kids and live out of order, undisciplined, immoral lives. So just aging isn't good enough. It's about maturing. And Paul said, I model that. Look for models of Christian maturity and follow their example because that's the goal that God has for you. He wants to save you from the foolishness that is yourself and give you a mature way to think and help you to grow up spiritually so you can share in the wonderful world that God is preparing for the righteous to share in in the world to come. But those that are not prepared and those that have not heard the call or ignored the call will regret not listening to the voice of God and doing the will of God. Let's have no regrets, but instead, let's run all the way through the tape at the end of the race, which is the end of our lives. Going just as fast spiritually as we can, maintaining the momentum of the race all the way to the end. That's what Paul said is the mature way to look at things. And he says, you know, we need to be following mature people's example. So how do people grow up? Well, they grow up because they have spiritual parents. They have people that mentor them, that help them to grow in their understanding of the will of God and in their living the will of God in their lives. And you can't, you can't do that all on your own. You know, imagine if you turned loose a first grader and you gave him a series of textbooks and said, now this is first grade, read it. And when you're through, here's second grade. And you give them all the way through college, just keep reading these books. Now, what child would be able to read those books and comprehend them and wouldn't find themselves running outside to play? Uh, to begin with, we sometimes need discipline on the outside to discipline us to do the right thing. The goal of maturity is that I've internalized that and I don't need others to discipline me. I discipline myself 
to continue to learn and to grow. But it's not something you do on your own. You know, that's what the family of God is for. And so you and I play a role in others' lives in encouraging them, being examples for them, and being you know, spiritual partners with them, mentors of others. That's what Paul said he did. And, of course, he learned that from Christ. Christ didn't just come down and walk around and do miracles and heal people and teach profound things. He called 12 so that they could be with him. He could train, and model, and mentor them so they could be sent out at the end of the process. That was as important a mission of Jesus as his teaching and his healing, was preparing people mature enough to carry on the mission of Jesus when he was gone. So you and I now are those people that will pass the torch. Let us <clears throat> be faithful. Let us run our race. Let us remember the prize to which we are called and remember the mature way to look at things. We never arrive. We're always in process. We always have new opportunities of spiritual growth. Uh, I find myself uh, learning new things about God uh, every month. I come up with something I didn't understand before that now I understand better. You just even your understanding. I mean, I've been studying the Bible intently and in ministry for over 50 years, but I'm learning new things. You think maybe there are a few things you might could learn? I suspect so. And so let's stay in the process. Let's stay in the race to the end. Let us pray. Gracious Father and loving God, we thank you for calling us out of our routine, uh, boring lives and to become a part of your eternal family. We are so thankful, Father, that you've called us heavenward in Christ. And we pray, Father, you'll help us to grow up and mature and help others to grow up and mature as well as help others to find a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to fulfill our mission together as ambassadors of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.